Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Power outages, nuclear fallout, roving bands of violent nuts on desolate roads, and military occupation. No, this is not a preview for Trump 2020. This is the new drama, How It Ends, starring our guests Theo James and Forrest Whitaker, and it hits Netflix this Friday. Let's take a look. Hey, what time is it? Six in the morning, in Seattle. My mother just called. What happened last night? I'm sorry. He was into me from the second I got in. Why did you move my daughter away from me? Moving was Sam's idea. If I'd asked for his blessing last night, he would have said no, so I didn't. I was breathing late. Okay, I gotta go. Okay, call me when you get to the airport. What was that? Well, something's wrong. Sam. I'm We have unconfirmed reports of a large seismic event off the California coast with reports of power outages across the United States. Why didn't you come back? I didn't know where else to go. Have you talked to Sam? We got disconnected. What's the last thing she said? She sounded scared. Let's look at what we know, Will. We have no idea what's happening. Yet we got F-22s doing flybys. My only daughter, she's alone. 2,000 miles away. So I only have one question for you. Are you coming with me? All communications are down. The government is silent. We don't know who or what is causing this. There's a lot to be afraid of out there. There's a lot of real danger. You should have told me that you had a gun. I'm assuming that you've never fired a firearm. I've seen war game simulations, events just like this. They're designed to erase rational behavior with what appears to be a singular incident. You ever seen clouds like that before? Will, get back in the car! I need you to promise to always keep us safe. I promise you. You just drive, I got this. One, two, three! Welcome Theo James and Forrest Whitaker. That title, I feel like that title is a phrase that's on my mind a lot these days. Um, uh, this movie is really a two-hander between the two of you. There's other people in it, but it, the heart of the film is, are these two men sort of learning to understand and love each other by a certain point within the film? What was it like working together? Do you rehearse it all beforehand when so much of it sort of rests on the bond that these two characters are going to forge throughout throughout the movie? Um, we, not really. I mean, um, again, luckily we shot it sequentially, so you have the, the in a way, the the more awkward it was at the beginning, in a, in a nice way, the exactly. better it was. You, you shot know. it sequentially? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the most of the stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, There's some, a couple of sidetracks, but... Yeah, and so it meant that you could use that awkwardness and, and, you know, not knowing each other that well. And then by the end, when we were shooting kind of the stuff, you know, with, with Forrest in the back of the car and kind of the end of the movie, yeah. we, we were, knew each other better and there was a, a familiarity that we could play from. Because the character, I mean, uh, Tom had this real antagonism towards, towards Will in the beginning. And so, you know, it's good to, to feel that kind of separation. But then, as, he, as, as Theo said, it, that bond starts to grow. Your character's kind of a, a tough guy is the wrong way to phrase it. I would say he's a hard man. And uh, the man that is sort of, you know, with his daughter is not necessarily the, the type of guy that he would, he would want. I mean, I think he's got some hard and fast rules, so he's kind of strict right. that way. But I think the thing about uh, Will or Theo was that he took his daughter away and moved her across the country. He was very close to his daughter. He wanted to protect her. Then he felt like this guy wasn't really able to take care of her. You know, she was taking care of him in his mind. And so that like created a wall, like he didn't think his daughter was being taken care of, he thought she was being taken from him. And so it takes a while, it takes through the movie, the journey of the movie to be able to, to see, you know, what he's capable of and who he, who he really is and how much he loves my daughter. Well, he has to learn to be capable of, of those things, right? It's just kind of like a, um, 
a straw dogs type scenario where the man by the end has to learn how to sort of forge his own path and, and defend himself. What was it like playing a character like that? I think Hollywood or movies is sort of filled with male characters like that. Did you look back on any of those performances or anything? Straw dogs being the most obvious one. Uh, in terms of kind of, uh, you know, boys becoming men, I guess. Uh, not not specifically. Um, I, I felt like... Uh, he kind of represented, in a way, the generation that I'm a part of, which, uh, you know, we don't have necessarily the skills that my parents had and their parents had. Where it, and also because we're so, you know, um, bound to the, the ease of technology and everything that that brings with us, uh, with it, then we're not ready for things that are thrown at us potentially when the power goes out we're done yeah kind yeah. of um and I can't google how to start a fire <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um because i was thinking i was saying this before but you know i remember when i first started driving we still had to use maps we didn't even have tom toms or whatever but that very quickly soon became you had satellite navigation whereas you know now i wouldn't you know i haven't looked at a map in years if i'm honest so he he kind of represents that that character that side of um our generation, but also maybe the people who take those things slightly for granted as well, as if he's not expected to have those skills, um, but then he has to learn to become that person. And it's also about kind of two very different types of men and how they look at life. As Forrest was saying, his character has a very specific set of rules, the way he sees life, um, and there's a black and white nature to that, whereas Will is a little bit complacent, um, you know, and, and, and a little softer in that way. But then they become, they uh, um, get to respect one an, one another on equal terms as the film goes on, basically. I think it's interesting, too, because the, the movie starts to explore what you'll do to survive. You know, as we get out and stuff and we start to greet all these different people and individuals who are, have lost all, all that they have, lost food, looking for water, looking for gasoline, all of a sudden you start to, to look at what is necessary and what will you do to survive. And I think in some ways, what he will do to save my daughter and to survive is very important for me to see. When I start to see that he's willing to even protect himself appropriately, then maybe he'll be able to protect her. And I'm starting to look at all these other individuals and I'm saying, look, you know, we, are, we have the right to live. And we're going to do what is necessary to, be, to do so. So it's a big, big interesting thing in the film, I think, to explore. You know, the Stanford experiments did that, you know, what will you do? Are you capable of doing atrocities and negative things in order, in order to survive or because of pressure or whatever? And the film explores that with all the people we meet, a lot of the people we meet. What is it like working on a uh, post-apocalyptic movie in this time, in the wake of the Bush administration and the war in Iraq and turmoil in the Middle East and all the questions that were really beginning to be asked about what could happen in the future of the world? Post-apocalyptic movies had a bit of a brief, uh, I think, trend because people didn't feel like those questions were being answered. Now, 10, 10 or so years later they haven't been answered and we're seeing a lot of the consequence of not answering those questions. And so po Apocalypse feels even more imminent in a, in a lot of ways for some of us. What's it like to sort of make a movie in that, during that feeling? Yeah, I never saw it as Apocalypse uh, in, the, in that sense. I saw it more as it reflects how close we feel to the potential for chaos you know, and I think, uh, you know... Apocalypse may be the wrong word because it implies something, yeah. Yes, I guess it implies, yeah. But but I think you're right in the sense, you know, in America, in Britain, the way things are evolving in the Middle East, there there is a sense that things could change very rapidly on a dime and, and could throw everything we conceive about our lives into jeopardy. I mean, you think about... You know, Syria, it was a very functioning, normal country. And then very quickly, it has, you know, become an absolute zone of chaos. And, um, you know, especially now, as you're saying, kind of in very tumultuous political times, there is that fear of, of you know, something could change and things could, could change very quickly. Yeah, it's not just in internal wars and things that are going on, but also what's going on with the global system, like the climate change that's happening in the world and the disasters that are happening all over the world, you know, from tsunamis to hurricanes to just shifts in great weather, melting of polar caps, you know, all of these things make you have to look at what will happen if, if people are put in a situation where they have to deal with these phenomena which are starting to occur all over the place. You know? we're, see, we're seeing, not to get too far into this tangent, but we're seeing how people are, are, are dealing with these kinds of phenomena and they are moving. 
They are trying to go to a different part of the world where they could survive. And that is where we are seeing the refugee crisis in so many ways. And in a lot of ways, the refugee crisis in certain areas does look almost post-apocalyptic, like, like certain scenes in this, in this movie. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, there's just a lot of the refugees are, are moving because of conflict and, and resources. So they're, they're, they're traveling to other countries all over the world, you know, trying to do so. And, and they're being put in camps. And so when you talk about this concept of groups, masses of people without, without ability to take care of themselves, without food, without water, without home, you know, you can see that actively existing. In places, I mean, I see it in like what's happening in Uganda with the influx of the South Sudanese who are going in. There's a million of them in camps, and you go in and you see this, and you think, not that the, not that it's reflective of this movie, but there are elements that are going on all over the world that we have to we have to like take note of, as you talk about in Syria and different places. You have to see serious, massive amounts of refugees. I think it's very much ref reflected in this movie just in terms of how it affects our psyche in the West and how it affects the way that we perceive the future. So many of us have trouble even perceiving a future right now that this feels almost more relatable or something that we have to deal with because any sort of better world doesn't feel like anyone is giving us that option or Im imagining something that we can look at right now. Yeah. Um, when you're making a movie like this, do you try to keep things like that out of your head and just focus sort of on what your character is 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 going through? Uh, no, I think I think you can draw on on how you perceive things that are happening around the world. I think that's definitely useful. Um, you know, for me, I wanted to be as have a naive have as much naivety as possible because he's a lawyer, but really he's a solicitor and he's not that far out of the college. So. Um, but, but yeah, I, th I think it's important to to understand what's happening globally because everything is going to affect your performance in some way. Does that affect your performance as well? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, it, it helps me look at the, have the images and the memories and the emotional content that like allows me to deal with the situation, understand what happens. I, I you know, I was talking to, you know, deal about it. I mean, I, I deal with conflict resolution around the world with my organization all the time. So I have seen some very extreme circumstances that are much more extreme even in some ways than the ones that I see in the film. You know, people trying to survive under circumstances, people being harmed, people being crowded into places, lacking of food, lacking of electricity, like all the things that we're talking about are like being in this technological world where there are places where there is no electricity, there is no fresh water, there are no food elements, and people start to go on foot to move to other places. They're not safe, women are abused, children are harmed, turned into soldiers, it's a different kind of world. And I guess, you know, that fuels me, but at the core of it, it also makes, it makes me understand what this movie has too, which is it's an undercurrent of like loving my daughter and me understanding how he loves my daughter. And so in, in respect, it does like circle itself to, to that place of like understanding, uh, even when all those things are put up on top of it. Uh, in this film, uh, it becomes the movement of why we go out into this world that has turned into chaos, as he says. You know? I would imagine uh, when you keep those things in your mind as well, you can also think of how your character would look at them. Like your character is a former Marine. He served for some time. He's probably been in a number of these areas and has a, com a bit of a different mindset or, or he views it with a different lens than maybe you do as someone who runs a foundation. You know, his, his job as a Marine might be a little bit different and therefore he views this world and this moment in a different way. I mean, definitely, I mean, he's, he's perceiving it where potential threats and conflicts are, but you have to still look at that on the other side of when you're working in an organization and you're dealing in an active war zone, like, say, in South Sudan. You still have to take those things into consideration. It's just different outcomes and what you're trying to, what you're trying to, to solve, you know, uh, with the people's safety and giving them the necessary supplies and things that they need to be able to survive and stuff. Uh, you, you're, you're still looking at, hopefully, the whole of it all you know, uh, to understand how the lack of resources causes certain conflicts in certain areas and exacerbates conflicts. Why at this point, like people are harming even like aid workers or UN workers um, just because they're bringing food and supplies to what they would consider their enemies. So it's like a, it's a lot of things that you have to lo look at uh, on the on that sort of uh, philanthropic side or, or uh, NGO side, you know. Um, Theo, well, hold on. I apologize for this, Forrest. What's it like to work with Forrest Whitaker, one of one of the greats? Uh, really, really, really terrible. Um, it's very tough. I was waiting for it. Very hard. 
No, it, it's, uh, you know, close your ears, but uh, Forrest has always been one of my favorite actors, and he, um, you know, two things I'd say. One is, you know, he he's despite an amazing career and everything he's done he's always a consummate professional he's always prepping and doing the work which i think is really inspiring because you know he wouldn't it doesn't necessarily have to but uh, but i think you know he he's it lives in him uh and secondly particularly with this part but generally with with how you function as an actor um i always felt when i'm watching for us he brings a soulfulness and an intellect to parts that that perhaps you wouldn't have necessarily knew, knew could contain that kind of soul and that kind of intellect and particularly with this part i thought it was really important because you know there's an there's a, an ability for the father to be kind of stoic and and you know um, authoritarian and uh bigoted in the way he seems he sees certain parts of the world ex-military but what Forrest throw Forrest Whitaker in there humanizes him immediately exactly yeah, I mean, yeah it's, like, it's incredible yeah um so so it was very very pleasant yeah I think of um you know I think it's one of your first roles but the color of money you know it's one scene that you have in that movie and it's a hustler who hustles our main character and somehow you walk away with that scene everybody empathizes with your character and not Paul Newman at the end of, at the end of that scene you have this incredible gift of just immediately uh, you're like an empathy machine mm. you know I don't know how you do it is it a tool that you know you have I don't really think about it that way I guess uh it's you know, drugs, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit too many of those, too many nights. I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, it was exciting. To, the work we were doing together, working with Theo, was, like, exceptional because I think he, he brought, like, a commitment to it that I was, like, I was really fascinated, too, like, by the work that you were doing, you know, and uh, how, how hard you were driven inside of it to make it make it really alive. And I think when I met you, you were, because he's got this, you have your accent, you know, normal speaking right now, and you are totally in character and totally with a, American accent, and so it was like, that was the first kind of meet. Although I'd seen him in film before, it was kind of like nice to see like how much you were committing to do everything. You know what I mean? So for and me, I just want to return the compliment. And a, you know, a lot of it takes place in a car, and it's just the two of you in a car. There's a lot of work to be done there for actors just to know how to make, I mean, even though the director's thinking about how to make it feel alive, actors have to do that as well, and you have to make it feel different and alive for you in, in each scene as well. Was that something that you guys talked about in between takes? How do we change this up? How do we keep it moving? Uh, yeah, definitely. We we were lucky in the sense that uh, the director David he wanted everything to be set to be set in the car, so we didn't do any green screen car stuff. So it was either us driving, or a top rider and a stunt guy driving with us in the car. Uh, so that helps. I think you know, uh, for example, we would we. We would, if it was hot and clammy, we'd want to be hot and clammy and not have air conditioning on. And that, do you know what I mean? Those kind of things help. I think, I think living it as much as possible, if you, in a way, even though in the strange construct of a movie, helps. So, all those, all those little bits and pieces um, made it kind of easy in a way. I think, it, I think if we'd done any green screen car stuff, I would have found that pretty tough. Yeah, been tough. Know, like. I mean, I think David, the director, and you guys had a really strong relationship, so. You would make suggestions and stuff that, like, I think, move forward a number of things together. So uh, it was nice to watch that kind of collaboration, that kind of work you're doing. You know. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I thought. I want to go to audience questions, but I want to ask a quick question about a movie that you produced for us. Sorry to bother you, which just came out last right. weekend. I think it's. Um, okay. One of the, yeah, me and my partner Nina Yang. I think it's one of the most radical movies to come out in a really long time. I think it's a really necessary movie, and as important as it is, it's also really funny and really entertaining. How did you know that Boots Riley's vision and that script could make the movie that it made? There are so many people who would not take the chance on something that crazy. I think Boots was trying for a long time to get it done. I think, uh, I think he told me like 10, 15 yeah. years. Yeah. But uh, my partner, Nina, like she really really loved the script and we talked about it and decided to move forward with it you know and, and I think the vision of what he did is not something that you could completely imagine until you actually see it so um, it's it just it just it all fell into place I think first from Boots and then him talking and then from Nina and then we started to, we decided to do it and now it's made and we've been really fortunate to work with some really amazing filmmakers and I think Boots is is a is a filmmaker that's going to be making amazing films for a long time. I really hope so. I really hope so. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's the question? 
Hi guys. Right here. Um, well, you guys actually answered my first question, but it's, I have a I have a backup. You both sort of come from these like these worlds of like uh, bigger budget studio films, whether that's like the Divergent series for you, or most recently Arrival for you. Um, I'm just curious, how does working on a Netflix production differ from working anywhere else? Um, I, I think uh, it's quite refreshing, to be honest. I don't, whether this will change or not, but um, they are quite, uh, uh, in a nice way, they're, they're very ha hands-off, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and they, they let you run with it, basically. Um, there's, there's less control, and I think that can be very liberating. Um, for not only the actors but also the director, the producers, uh, because there's a, a level of trust there. How long that'll last, I don't know. As with any growing big, you know, semi-studio system, always fingers creep into the pie inevitably. But um, we found it certainly very refreshing and easy. Do you want to take the room? And I think no. I think what he said is yeah. Uh, right here. Hi. Thank you both for coming. So my question is for you, Forrest. Um, a couple of years ago, you starred in a Broadway play, and you were fantastic. So I wanted to ask, how hard was the transition from theater back to acting in front of a camera? And the challenges maybe you faced, was it difficult? Um, I think going into the play, and like living in that universe was was uh, one that I had to learn and get the rhythm of, and it was really quick. We we didn't. Uh, I think it were two weeks, and we were already doing our um, our sort of audience uh, tech and stuff. So it was really fast. Yeah, and then we kind of put it up, and I was struggling to like get the ease. And it was towards the middle and the end of it that I started the roof play really found itself, and that was unique for me. You know uh, that process, particularly because that character had like ninety some odd percent of the dialogue. And uh, so that was a uh, that was a journey too for me as to learn. I learned a lot. Uh, I'll do it again. I just don't know when. You know. Yeah. Uh, next question. I think we have two more right here. Hello, both of you. Hi, Theo and Forrest. Uh, I just want to ask you, what would you be doing if you both weren't actors? Um, I would uh, be probably some kind of pole dancer. No. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I always wanted to be a policeman. Yeah, that would be mine. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I guess I think I would have gone into naturopathic medicine. I don't know. I was always, always been really fascinated by it. I always looked at it and thought it would be interesting and tried to do correspondence courses and stuff. <laughs> you know, and, uh, Did you really? You yeah. Uh, I, there was a school called Clayton School of you know, Medicine, it was like, and I tried to do it there. And, I still read it. It's kind of interesting to me. That's all. Thank you very much. How old were you when you started acting? Um, I was, see, 19, 20? Yeah, yeah because uh, I had done a musical, a couple of musicals in high school, but I'd sang, but I'd, I was just a singer in the choir, so I was, and then I got to sing. But I hadn't uh, done any, I, I didn't take acting classes until I was in conservatory in college, and I, I started working pretty much right away while I was in conservatory. What was your first role? You know, for a film or for film? Fast Times Ridgemont High oh, right. was okay. the real first kind of character I got to play. Yeah, yeah Charles Jefferson. <laughs> uh, last question. Um, hi, my question is for Theo. So we've seen you as a musician and actor, so I was wondering if you've considered directing as well. Uh, I'd love to, but uh, I probably, when I'm uh, older and wiser, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, I, I'm not sure I want to be purely in front of the camera for the rest of my life. So, um, yes, perhaps in the future. What prompts the, that feeling, not wanting to be purely in front of the camera? Um, it's it's a, a, bit, a bit of a lack of agency, I guess. Um, and also, um, I, I kind of, uh, I sometimes find it, Difficult, the uh, the kind of the press side and, and being front forward all the time. So 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 sometimes the the idea of being behind camera is uh, alluring in that way. Alluring. Why the fuck am I using that word? But <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah. <laughs> is that what drove you to be one of the reasons that drove you to be behind the camera a little bit more for us? I mean, you've directed a number of times. You're you you've produced. You've been producing for a number of years. Was it the idea of having more agency over the over over the work you were putting out? Um, it started like, organically, you know, I, when I first was in college, uh, the first thing I was offered professionally was as a writer, you know, so this company I didn't sell my script to, you know, 
but they started me directing music videos. And so it started to go from there while I was working. I would direct sometimes. And then I, 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 I thought, well, there's stories that I'd like to tell, things I'd like to say. And so it, it just kind of organically grew, you know. And finally I ended up directing a number of films. And I haven't directed in a long time, so. Yeah, it's been, it's been a few years, right? <laughs> I don't know what, know what it's going to be like when, if I try again. But Are you going to try again? Uh, with the right thing. You know, yeah, for sure. I like it. I, I've never directed myself either. I always, I'm never in any of the projects that I've directed. So one day I'll probably play a small part somewhere in it. You know. Uh, well, guys, congratulations on how it ends. It comes to Netflix this Friday. It's uh, beautiful. It's stylish. Two really great performances at the center of it. Please give a big round of applause for Theo and Forrest Whitaker.